Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session. We really look forward to hosting you today and to sharing important information with you. Just some housekeeping rules. Once again, it's a Zoom platform. If you have any questions you want to ask, you can do it through our chat box facility. If you have load shedding and poor connectivity, this will definitely um, influence your abil ability to, to join this event. But remember, it is recorded. It will be uploaded onto our platform. So if you want to send it to people as well, you will be able to do this. Please ensure that you are on mute and contribute to an enjoyable event experience to everyone. Today, the spotlight will be on innovation, technology, payments, and data. We really feel that being innovative in this current environment is very, very important. And we want to motivate our members to be innovative and think out of the box. On, 20, on the 20th of September, we will also have an additional session specifically based on debit check mandates. We already had sessions on debit check, but we feel that there is definitely a need for our members to get more information on mandates. And then also on the 20th of October, we will be having our MFSA AGM and celebration. This will be a hybrid session where you can attend in person or you can, can attend digitally. We really do motivate our members to attend um, in person so that we can meet and greet you again. If you want to register for the information session for Debbie Check So Long, you can do this by also scanning your QR code um, and making sure that you do attend the session and making sure that everyone who works for you and has information or wants to get in more information and do a team as well. Then everyone to put yourself on mute so that we don't hear all of your discussions. Um, but we really do look forward to seeing you in the Debbie Tech, Tech Check session and also at our AGM and conference. Good. Next slide. This is our sponsors for our session. It's Actas, African Unity, Alps, Aspis, New Pine Delta, Bankingly Experian, Groups Are Us, Sure Card, Real Pine, Micamax, Sure Systems, TransUnion, and the Universal Insurance. We always say without them, this would not have been possible, and we really do thank them for, um, for their support. A lot of them will also be at our AGM and conference, and they are looking forward to meeting with you again and providing you with new updated information. This is what our program will look like today. The Sure System videos and presentation, a complete payments update by Angeline van der Walt, then a presentation by um, Jaco Rousseau focusing on data and technology and managing your credit decisions and how important that is. Then, as always, we will have a fun element with prizes that we give away and then a very informative panel discussion, data-driven innovation, the importance of data and making use of data in the right places. We really then do... Um, want our members to complete our survey, and then we will see you again at our next session. So let's start with the day. Right, let's look at the Sure Systems video. We've all seen a movie with two strong, tough guys, each equipped with a baseball bat sent to collect money. Why not opt for one of the best solutions for collecting payments from your clients without the need of a couple of brawny goons? Managing recurring payments can be overwhelming. At Shaw Systems, we've developed Shaw Debit, a cost-effective payment solution for collecting money from your customers' bank accounts. It's safer, features a user-friendly interface, and works on any browser or mobile device. Sure Debit gives you easy and organized access to your client's payment information and is built for all transactional types of Debit Check currently available on the market, either face-to-face -face with your client using a card swipe machine or not face-to-face -face using a cell phone. Debit Check is similar to a debit order payment system, but by requiring authentication, it's more secure and convenient, giving you and your customer peace of mind. Better yet, Debit Check collections are processed before EFT debit orders on a client's bank account. If you prefer something different, we also offer cash access cards, a simple and practical cashless payout solution for your business, as well as traditional EFT debit orders. Sure Debit also features an easy integration module with which you can manage your payments directly using your own custom designed software. With our latest technology and over 15 years of experience in payments, we pride ourselves on speed, quality of service, uptime and reliability. At Shaw Systems, our clients are our business partners. 
we understand the many challenges that startups and existing businesses may face. We strive to equip you with the necessary tools to grow your business and look forward to walking this journey with you. Thank you so much. What a lovely video. Next, we will listen to Conrad from Sure Systems, and he will be telling us more about their product and who they really are. Hi, guys. Thank you, Naomi. Um, yes, uh, I'm just going to give you guys a little presentation of Sure Systems and what we offer. I'll just give you guys a little bit of background on myself, where I come from. Um, so you just can put a face to the, to the company. Um, so I'm just quickly going to share the presentation. Can you guys see the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Um, yes, I'm just going to quickly talk about myself. I'm Conrad Stoll, CEO of Sure Systems. I've been in the industry um is for very long from 1997 when i was 20 years old i started in in this business uh, basically as an it support consultant and then yeah i've moved across all platforms in the industry from um, it support to learn admin support did some payments and banking and even managed uh, physical cash loan branches uh, more than 20 branches at one point so I really understand the, the challenges and, and that Michael in this face today, understand the market, understand, understand what's going on on the ground. And um, yeah, what even what the impact is of debit check on the micro lenders today. So I think myself and my team strive to keep personal relationship with our customers. We we try to, you've got a direct con, direct line to me and my team. Um, we always open and always available. Your success is our success. Um, so it's in our interest to, to make sure your business works and that your system is up. Uh, one thing that I did learn in the 25 years um, is uh, uh, the way a micro lender can adapt. Uh, we've had many changes over the past years and there's more changes coming. And I uh, must say the micro lenders always find ways to move forward and adapt to the market. So just a little bit about Sure Systems. Um, we, we, did, we were part of the Edo acquiring um, since 2006. We previously offered ADO and NATO transactions. So with the ADO, we also had obviously the terminals, uh, past terminals. Uh, um, and when DeviCheck started, we decided to build a completely new system uh, that, that we call Sure Debit today. Um, and the whole idea or advantages with that was to, to have a clean system, to have it clean and reliable and build it from, from scratch. Uh, our goal or our aim was to have it to, to make it user friendly, stable, reliable, and fast. And since 2018, it's been live, and I'm really happy to report that we achieved those goals. Um, with Sure Debit, um, the, we've got different functions um, in, with DebitCheck, the different mandate types. Um, everybody knows the type of mandates today. So uh, I'm not going to explain exactly what each mandate type is, but we've got the TT1 real time delayed, TT2 batch. TT3 post uh, transactions, that is the card authentication and is real time. That's also obviously the most uh, um, used in our market today um, because it's the quickest and, and it works the best. On the operational functions that you can do on SureDebit on our web, uh, web portal, um, it, is, it allows you to do uh, um, to amend mandates, cancel mandates, do batch amendments. With the batch amendments, that's when you want to move uh, a specific payday to a new payday. If you take December, uh, you want to move some of your clients with pay on the 25th to the 15th, uh, you can do it in batch formats. You don't have to do one by one. Then uh, um, there's obviously reporting uh, for your payments that is received. 
and other management reports. We also have a function where you can view your signed documents. I'll explain a little bit about the sign signing function because we built something in on our terminal to allow you to sign uh, documents electronically. Um, so if I move on from a cashless perspective for cash loans or micro lenders that want to work cashless, we've got a cash access card that allows you to load the card, uh, um, to load the loan uh, to the card. And um, by doing that, working cashless, uh, the client can withdraw at any ATM or POS, um, debit card uh, machine at ShopRite or Pick and Pay. And um, the cards can be replaced and new pins can be issued, everything online on a web portal. Um, funds that you collect on your debit check is immediately available to transfer to the um, cash access card. And um, the funds is also immediately available for the customer to withdraw the funds. Um, then we also offer external transfers. That's when you want to transfer the money to the client's bank account. Um, directly. Uh, if you do a normal EFT transfer, that's obviously takes about 24 hours. But we also offer the RTC, which is real time credits. And that's to also to the external bank accounts where the funds will be available immediately. Obviously, the cost on, on RTC is a bit more expensive than EFT, but we do have the function interested. Then with integration, uh, we already have integration partners, loan administration systems that is integrated with us, but our system is capable to integrate to any system and um, the API is available. There's no development on sure system sites. It's literally the company that want to integrate to us just needs to do some uh, development to make the integration work. Then um, the functions, is, it's, it's similar to what is available on our website all the functions that you can do via integration is to initiate mandates, cancel, reschedule, amend the mandate, download your receipts to your admin system, and then you can obviously do your, integrate your loan transfers as well. So when you do a loan, the money can automatically be transferred when the debit check is loaded successful. Then just some detail on our POS terminals. Um, we currently, we, our terminals is serviced by Sure Systems and it's on a rental basis. So you don't need to do anything on the terminal. We manage it, we sort it. Uh, we offer two terminals, uh, the desktop terminal and then the, um, the mobile terminal. Desktop terminals are what we call fixed terminal. It's more fixed to a specific desktop station. Um, and it's, it works with infinite or um, Wi-Fi. Whereas the mobile terminal is more flexible. You can go out into the market, visit clients to do your debt collections, or just work remotely um, uh, with the terminal. It's got, it works on 3G, uh, GPRS, and it's got a battery. So it's completely mobile and works loose from a PC. Um, it's also the advantage of using the mobiles is that it also allows you, you know, offer setup to maybe use one pass instead of three fixed terminals, because you can just hand the terminal to the other consultant to help the client. So that's just something on that. Our terminals also now offer a signature function. Um, that is when you want to sign documents electronically, uh, either via integration partners or via our terminal itself. Our system allows you to save a document and that, and, and that document will be signed on the terminal and save on your mandate when you load a TT3. It's only available on the TT3 at this moment. And yeah, that's my story. Um, there's our contact information. I think if you guys have any questions, you can obviously uh, send it via Leonie and them, and um, we'll take it from there. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Conrad, and also thank you for, for your support, also, always supporting the industry and the association as well. There's the details of Conrad, his number is 087-820-1423, and you can email them at info at suresystems.co.za. Thank you once again, Conrad, we really do appreciate the information. Pleasure, thank you for the opportunity. Right. Next, we are going to have a presentation by Angeline van der Valt. 
Angeline is the project and program management consultant at the PSSF. She really works well in the payment system and she is the guru and also the one that knows a lot about DebiCheck, IDO and NIDO, real-time clearing, SWIFT, EFT and everything that I don't know about. So, um, Angeline, we do welcome you um, as part of the session today. We thank you so much for um, always presenting to our members and we look forward to the information that you're going to share. Good morning, everybody. Can you see my presentation? Yes, I can see it. Thank you very much. Okay, so I put a question mark after the complete because I don't know if anybody knows what the complete payments update is because there's so many things happening within the payments arena at the moment. Um, so I'm going to look at some, give you some background on some regulatory initiatives a little bit around industry and industry players initiative, and then I'll put a disclaimer here. Um, payments industry is one of the fastest moving, fastest growing industries in the world. Um, the presentation that I'm giving you today is just a, a view from my perspective on what I think is interesting and what is happening in there that you guys might find interesting. Interesting. And it's not um, my my goal isn't to give you a complete a, um, academic review of everything that's happening and give you a blow by blow what's happening month by month, what's going to happen on a month by month basis within the rest of um, within South Africa and the rest of the world. This is just a bird's eye view. If you've listened to Moritz speaking, Moritz has been talking about banking as an open um, as a service, open banking, digital banking, um, central bank, um, um, digital currencies, crypto, the cryptocurrencies. Um, they talk about the um, payment industry body that I'll touch on a bit later. And then one of the um, acquirers has just launched a, a facility where you use your cell phone as the POS device. So you tap your card on a cell phone. Ikoka launched that a few months ago. And then there's pay by face. You guys, you can go into a, into a shop and you can, um, they've got a iPad or a, a tablet sitting there. You go and you, it recognizes your face. So I don't know how that's going to work. Um, my uh, Facebook confuses me and my um, sister Gwendy continually and tag both of us in each other's pictures. So I don't know if that's going to be such a safe option, but that's what, what's happening across the industry at the moment. So let's start with the industry, the industry, um, the, the regulatory initiatives. So we've got the Financial Action Task Force. You all know them as FATF requirements where you have to provide additional information to ensure that the um, the the central bodies know that um, or the banks can also check that you are not laundering money, that you are not paying to a sanctioned country, that you are not breaking any laws or any regulations, that you are sticking within your one million rand um, discretionary overseas um, overseas allowance, et cetera, et cetera. Then we've got ball three, ball four. It's so confusing. Ball three is being called ball, 3.1 is being called ball four. I've got a slide just here of what is, what new, what's new with ball four. Um, anybody who's interested, I'll gladly share the slide with you because it's so small. I can't actually read what's standing on there, but I'm happy to share the slide with anybody. Then we all know about the Poppy Act that came into play a few years ago. People are still struggling to get calls from people to say, do I want to buy this? Do I want this? Um, can they sell me that? Can they do an assessment for me on X, Y, and Z? We need to um, make sure that we as an industry protect the, the information that's given to us in how can I put it, Tr by people trusting us 
to do what we need to do with that information only. And from a bank perspective, the banks obviously are very, very um, rigorously tested and checked on um, protection of personal information. Then we can look at the payments industry body. Now, you guys all know that PASA as an organization is going to be changing to the payments industry body. Now, the payments industry body design committee has spent quite a number of months coming up with a draft of what the scope of work of that payments body would be. It's going to be an inclusive body. Currently, PASA as the payments association mostly um, has got members that are banks. The PSSF, Payment System Stakeholder Forum, does form part of PASA, but on an ancillary perspective, we're not um, part of the decision making or anything like that. So with the introduction of the payments industry body, we are, um, we are hoping that the inclusivity obviously its associations and by default then the members a bigger voice within the banking environment so the payments is, uh, the payment industry body will be looking at um, rule setting standard setting risk management compliance management administrative support it's going to look at industry representation as i said making sure that everybody is inclusively presented it's going to look at project delivery, making sure that projects are designed and delivered and managed according to best practice, best principles. Um, then obviously capacity building. Um, um, PASA has had some um, training courses that they've offered on um, um, foundation of payments, et cetera, et cetera, that anybody that is interested are welcome to participate in. They're going to look at strategy development, thought leadership, um, payment statistics, industry facilitation, and then obviously the payment system operators, which is the, the bank serves of the world that we know very well. SAMOS as the settlement um, body, SWIFT, Visa, MasterCard, all the Amex diners, all those are system operators. And then we've got system operators sitting here like Sure Systems giving feedback just now, um, previously, and then um, Alps, um, New Pay, you guys, um, Real Pay, you guys know the um, system operators that's working there within the industry. So from a payment industry body perspective, um, PASA is looking at, and the Saab is looking at, um, of inclusivity, supporting the um, Saab's 2025 vision. I did not include um, all the projects out of the Saab 2025 vision. Anybody that's interested in that can just ask me and I will make sure that I send it through to um, um, the MFSA office and they can share it with you. From a... Um, while I'm on that point, if I can just ask anybody sending me questions, please filter it through the um, MFSA offices so that um, we've got a consolidated view of everybody that's sending me information. I do not know if you belong to the MFSA or not, and I don't want to share information with people that might not be um, required to be shared with. Then looking at some industry initiatives, I don't think you've heard of Debbie Check. Maybe you've heard of Debbie Check. Um, Debbie Check <laughs> has been running, as um, Conrad said, for the last few years. There's been some ups and downs with Debbie Check. There has been um, currently Debbie Check is stable with known challenges. One of them is being the non face to face and remote face to face. Um, authentication. So from a non-face-to-face, -face, you're sitting on a call with somebody, remote face-to-face -face is you under a tree in Lusiki Siki, and um, you need to face-to-face -face help this person or non-face-to-face -face help this person in order to authenticate a um, debit order. Um, currently, there's an initiative run by PASA looking at alternative solutions as well as an awareness and education campaign that they are launching to make sure that everybody is aware 
of everything that they are allowed and that they are not allowed to do from a um, Debbie check perspective. One of the, um, some of the enhancements that's happening at the moment is for instance, the unique ident um, transaction identifier, the automation of session and assignment. Our session and assignment is when you are moving bank as a, as a, a business a beneficiary, or you are, your system operator is moving to a different bank, uh, taking you to a different bank, or um, you, um, you want to start a new business, uh, you want to change your mandates to another um, um, acquiring bank, and that means that you have to get all your debit orders re-authenticated. No, there's a process that they follow, and that is a currently a, ma a manual process, but it's going to be automated so that you can get your um, debit orders into the issuing bank with the correct um, relationships between you and your acquiring bank um, so that that is going to work. RFI, real-time amendments without authorization, that is being aligned with the RMS deliverable RMS being the registered mandate service. I'll speak about that in a second. And then also there's a um, going to be um, a focus put on um, the BCP, uh, uh, business continuity, if something goes wrong from a debit check perspective. That's all um, a few of the enhancements that's being looked at currently. Then we get to registered mandate service. Now, you are, are aware that RMS is actually a um, service that's being offered uh, if your mandate isn't authenticated. It falls back to, you can fall back to RMS to get your mandate registered and continue collecting. That RMS has got similar um, dispute rules that you would find that you found in the NATO environment. It's not as strict as the um, or as good as the um, dispute management that you find in Debicheck. But um, the Reserve Bank has always said that's a that's a short term solution. That's why the alternative solutions are being looked at for non face to face and remote face to face to ensure that those transactions are failing only in extenuating circumstances and also the awareness and education so that the um, consumer knows they have to authenticate. Then we've got the Rapids Payments Program. Now, um, Rapid Payments Program is a, um, it's seen as an alternative to cash and it provides immediate payment uh, benefits where you can, like for instance, the QR codes can be seen as a rapid payments type of program, but this is in, uh, using other methodologies as well. Then in the future soon, we're going to have modern, as we had with ADA and ADA, there will be moder modernization of EFT and RTC credits. So similar to what we did with DebiCheck, um, EFT and RTC also needs to be modernized and brought onto um, a ISO 2022 platform so that there is additional validations that can happen, et cetera, et cetera. Then Fleet is migrating to Europe, MasterCard and Visa, that's the EMV. So Fleet Cards currently is only Max Stripe and the decision was taken a while ago that fleet needs to migrate to EMV and also be EMV op, um, interoperable operable on EMV. Then we've got the QR codes. Now that is um, a PASA and the SOP wants transactions to be interoperable. So if somebody does something like a QR code, they want everybody to be able to um, there to be rules and standards for QR codes and how you manage that. And then anybody that wants to participate can participate with, with QR codes, et cetera. So that's to make QR codes interoperable. Currently, QR codes is done very um, um, closed looped with um, specific, specific banks and some 
um, other organizations that also allow QR codes, but that's just in its infancy at the moment. And um, whether that's ever going to become a thing or not, I don't know. Whether face, pay by face is going to be a thing, I don't know either. Then some of the industry and industry players changes that's happening. Um, um, SWIFT, the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications, those are the guys that um, the banks use to settle with um, SAMOS, the, uh, the South African, um, what is it, South African Multiple Options Settlement System. So that is a, a operation, an operation that sits within this um, South African Reserve Bank, where the banks settle each other. And then SWIFT is also an international network where if you send money to somebody in London, that money most likely is going by the SWIFT network, going to, um, if it's bank to bank. That currently is going undergoing a upgrade as well, moving into ISO 2022. The high value payment systems, they call it uh, HVPS plus, and you'll see later on the CBPR also comes in for the cross-border where they are updating the um, uh, messaging formats, messaging standards that needs to transport these messages so that there is additional information that can be gained off the, off the transaction. And a lot of um, businesses are using that additional information. For instance, they put an invoice um, number in there so that they get um, they can do straight through processing where the transaction comes into the system. It picks up that invoice number and it, it automatically um, ticks it off next to the, next to the payment. Then um, there's modernizing of the South African National Payment System. One of the projects is the modernization of payments high value credit projects. That is the SAMOS V8, as it's commonly called, um, which is the South African high value payments system, where we settle between each other, between the banks. And that um, um, development is hopefully going live in, on the 17th of September. 17th of September, it's scheduled for there. It is going to be one of the forerunners in the world of going live with ISO 2022 on SWIFT. Then following close on its heels in November is the cross-border payments and reporting, which is also moving to the ISO 2022. The decision from SWIFT there was that um, everybody receiving payments must be able to receive both the old standard MT format messages as well as the new standard ISO formats, which we're calling the MX format, and, um, you, um, and process both those um, variations within their system until um, 2025. Um, 2025, there will be no more um, support or allowed uh, um, allowance for empty messages to be transported between participants and settled within um, uh, flowing through the SWIFT network. So that is to provide, as I said, additional information. This specifically cross-border is your sanction screening, who the money comes from, who it goes to, um, making sure that you're not breaching your allowable um, um, discretionary allowance to take overseas. Um, the, the, I think it's a million rand now ex, um, for everybody to get that right. Then I don't know if you guys, you must have seen stuff about Project Corker. Now, Project Corker is, um, one and two has been conducted so far. Now, Project Corker is the SAMOS, um, uh, is the SAAB initiative for FinTech to review and to look at FinTech options. From a FinTech perspective, they're looking at payments, lending, um, business to business, capital raising, all those services they want to be able to do um, from a fintech perspective. Now, um, Project Coca One was to make sure that distributed ledgers can be done, and there was distributed ledgers created 
shared and that project then was deemed a success that phase they then went into project mode two now project corker two it was aimed to issue clear and settle um soft debentures that's debt security i don't know if you guys know about that distributed uh, distributed ledger um um, technologies with two settlement options, a wholesale central bank currency and a formal um, cent, uh, form, uh, which will be like a central bank crypto type currency, and then a wholesale settlement currency um, using tokens that will be, um, that is what the banks between themselves will use in order to settle between each other. This is just a extremely extremely high level overview of what's happening in the industry there's hundreds of other projects um, that is um, happening across the industry um, we can i can if yeah if anybody is interested in anything more as i said i didn't go into all the sub projects for 2025 um, if there's anything that anybody would like to know, I'd rather provide you with the links so that you can go and do your own investigations of what's happening. Most of the stuff is in the public domain and anybody that's interested can go and investigate it. There's a lot of things that people are trying out at the moment. I'm sure there will be a lot of fly by night things happening that everybody is going to say this is the next big, big thing and it might not pan out to be. And it also depends, as we know, on actual consumer um, appetite and risk, uh, risk appetite. And actually, you know, there's forerunners that actually want to, put, uh, to take part in new things. But, but that's me for now. I think. Um, if anybody's interested in more, I can give them more information, but I think it would be too much to give them. It, uh, yeah, this is just a, a look through the need, the eye of the needle. Thank you so much, Angeline. Yes, I think it's a lot of information to, to process. And like I said to our members, you know, we are recording these sessions so you can go through the information as well. If you have any questions that you want to post to Angeline, you are more than welcome to um send me an email to gm at mfsa.net or you can send me a WhatsApp. We will then collate the information and we will um, write our answers and send it through to you, possibly in a newsletter. Angeline, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, very, very informative and we really do appreciate your time. Thank you, have a nice You too, thank you. Right, up next, we have data and technology managing your credit decisions. We have Yaku Risawi, is the CEO of, of Principa, and he has been part of the industry for almost 29 years. He specializes in insurance, retail, and banking, and, and I think really he's got a lot of information on data. Um, he's a leader, a motivator, and an imagineer, and he's got a Bachelor's of Science degree. Yaku, thank you so much for agreeing to participate in our session. We really do look forward to your presentation. Welcome, Yaku. Thank you, Leone. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to um, to all your members or fellow members, I should say, as we are also a member of the MFSA. Um, and today, I've decided not to uh, to be guided by a presentation, but to uh, to tell you a couple of stories. I think the 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 challenge in terms of uh, presenting to the MFSA is always the 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 width or the breadth of the member base, right? So on the one hand, you've got uh, extremely sophisticated um, lenders. And on the other hand, you have uh, fairly small um, service providers that rely on uh, a lot of manual processes and uh, and and uh, fairly uh, simple technological solutions. Um, and so my talk today, I want to pitch at the, at the members that are not that far down the path yet, right, from a data and um, technology perspective, and uh, call it a motivational talk if you want, um, but really just to, to encourage um, all the members and especially the smaller members to, to start on this uh, journey, you know, so it's exciting to see the things happening uh, in this space, I think. You know, uh, technology is becoming incredibly uh, affordable access to sophisticated solutions. I mean, 
um, just the, um, the sure systems presentation earlier, right? There you've got access to a fair amount of sophistication um, by simply um, connecting your loan management uh, system or platform uh, via API, you can get access to a fairly sophisticated payment uh, payment platform. And that that's the story of, of the world we're operating in. And so um, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories uh, and talk through a couple of definitions just, uh, and then I want to give you some, uh, I guess, some practical pointers in terms of how to start. If you're fairly advanced down this uh, path, then hopefully I'll spark some ideas um, in terms of how you can take things even further in your in your particular business. So the first story I'm going to tell you, and if at any time you have questions or want to engage, then please uh, just jump on the chat. And Leonie, if you can maybe just keep an eye on that, and then we'll see uh, that we leave a bit of time at the end just for some open conversations and uh, and exploration. Um, so the first story I want to tell you is about uh, about concrete flooring. Um, and many years ago, when I was uh, a student at the University of the Orange Free State, I had a I had a friend, um, Johan Scholz, scholar as we called him, um, and he studied uh, Baurekenkunde. I'm sorry, I don't know what the English uh, name is for Baurekenkunde, but the guys that actually um, do the cost calculations on a building project. And um, fast forward a couple of years later, we're all uh, working in Cape Town. And we, um, in our mid to late 20s, I guess, and Scola started a, a concrete flooring business very successfully from scratch. So his days were consumed with uh, with casting factory floors um, and uh, and the science and art that's involved with that. And then one day we were having a Brian myself, uh, one of my friends. Uh, I studied maths and computer science. My one friend studied uh, business science and law. Uh, another uh, studied uh, also something in a legal direction. We were all standing at the bride just talking about, you know, the stuff we worry about at work and uh, the things we're managing there. And Scholar was fairly quiet, right? And um, at some point, him and I, we ended up alone next to the fire. And he said to me, he feels a little bit, um, he feels a little bit uh, overwhelmed and uh, um, like not confident, right? Hearing what we talk about and here he is and he's just, you know, he's older, he just... Because concrete floors, you know, I looked at him and I and I just realized I said I said to him, you know, scholar, the one thing you have to realize, we we are all just talking, right? We in this uh, highly academic conversation about uh, whatever it is that we do, but you are living the stuff that we only talk about on a daily basis, right? You've started a business, you're running a business. There's nothing that we can talk about that uh, that you should feel, uh, you know. Uh, bad about or inadequate about because we can only just learn from you and uh, the point of that that little story i want to make is this right so the the territory that um, the mfsa members operate in from a data and a technology perspective this is hostile territory right margins are tight um, the compliance and regulatory demands are high um, and data is not uh, is not always in abundance. Um, the risks are high. Uh, you are servicing um, a big portion of the the population that desperately need the services you provide. But that by uh, by nature of affordability and uh, and uh, job stability, there is significantly more risks involved. And so. I want to tell you that um, let no consultant or specialized um, data tech um, solutions provider convince you um, that you do not understand the application of decisions in a, in a challenging environment, right? Um, and let no one tell you that you are not making hundreds of difficult decisions on a daily basis with limited data um, available. And so as we go into this conversation, I really just want to encourage you that you, that you approach this with confidence, um, not, uh, not from a position of being overwhelmed or, or you know, um, feeling that this is, uh, this is Greek that I'm, that I'm speaking. Um, second story I want to tell you, and it really stuck with me, 
for the last couple of years is that uh, about 2017, we added our Cape Town offices. We uh, we had a roundtable event um, and we invited uh, uh, Forrester's consultant. And the theme of the discussion was uh, the age of the customer. And this was really when um, we had this, uh, we saw the explosion of uh, digital engagement. I think it was the, the first uh, inklings of uh, digital transformation. That's uh, the, the hype phrase nowadays. Um, and we invited a number of our key clients. So these were tier one credit providers, uh, insurance businesses uh, based in Cape Town. And we filled up the boardroom and the uh, forest consultant, he had a, a slides in, you, you do start feeling a little bit uh, inadequate, right? You feel like, okay, maybe you don't really uh, know much and you, you, you're way off and it's just impossible to, to achieve this. But anyway, um, about three, four slides in, he told the story. Um, this particular consultant was living in the UK to demonstrate the, you know, the age of the customer that he was referring to. And um, in the bull. where we want to be but we are so far off from that picture that you're drawing there how will we ever get there and then he he said this which uh which really just you know stuck with Right. The only thing they, that they need to know about me is what's my name and how do I like my coffee? They do not need to know how late I was out the previous night. They don't need to try and find a correlation about where I'll be going after I leave. And the next morning, right? They only need to know my name and how I like my coffee. And so what's the moral of this story? It's that as you look at your business and the potential or the opportunities for applying data-driven decisioning to manage your, uh, your credit environment is to ask yourself, what is the data I need to make this particular decision? And to then not be swayed by the, uh, the abundance of uh, data sources or technologies and be overwhelmed by that, if that makes sense. So... Really, what is the question I want to answer at this point? And that's what I focus on. Then, um, again, as we talk about data and technology and credit decisioning, I want to tell you another story. This one plays off in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, um, and in Riyadh uh, in particular. Uh, also, about seven, eight years ago, we had a client there, um, American Express, probably one of the, the premier card issuers in the Middle East. Um, they acquired um, one of our solutions specifically to manage uh, loan originations or card originations. And I went to, uh, to Riyadh to, to do the initial investigation in terms of the, the maturity and the sophistication of the business, understanding how we'll integrate with the uh, card management or um, loan management uh, platform in the background. And what amazed me in that um, assessment is that when I started engaging with the business and they had a totally manual process, right? So there were no automated origination solution in place. It's only once they've made the decision to originate the card with the manually load um, the client's details with the applicable limits and pricing and, and whatever on capture it in the, the back end system. 
what fascinated me about um, that experience was walking into the the region nations office and if i want you to imagine this that if you if you had to uh, depict the workflow the steps that you would go through to make a decision and to actually originate uh, an amex card in that uh, what would those steps be uh, where would you calculate the score where would you inquire with the bureau um, what would be the decision points when would it go for manual underwriting and when would you finally um, issue the card or, or the loan um, that the whole process was mimicked in a manual process you could literally walk into the office the office was uh, laid out in a u-shape the process started on this end and it went from table to table in paper form from desk to desk and it was one of the most sophisticated and accurate data-driven originations uh, processes I've seen and the technology in play at various points a little bit of excel and then uh, obviously an online bureau inquiry until the point where they they, they captured um, the card so the model of that story is that technology in itself does not um, guarantee sophistication and decision right so you could have a manual process that really is uh, well, follows fantastic decisioning principles and has elements of data-driven decisioning built into it. It does require manual intervention. You're capturing raw data into a, a spreadsheet to get a score. You then have a lookup table out to interpret the score. Uh, you've got a pricing table that you manually look up. But again, it's just, when you look at uh, your business, wherever you are on this journey, in terms of sophistication, adopting uh, data and technology to manage your credit decisions, making a separation between doing the right thing and then doing it efficiently. And so in that particular case, the only value that our system brought at that point was efficiency and execution. Right? So um, because of the sophistication of their, their manual process. And then to, to counter that, I want to tell you a story um, out of Africa. Um, so our founding uh, um, MD uh, of uh, Principa, then Pick Solutions, Stephen Leonard, some of you may know him. I think he is and will always be a legend in the, in the credit industry in, in South Africa and uh, still one of the wisest uh, men I know from a credit um, strategy and technology perspective many years ago he was dealing with a with a uk uh, bank that had operations in in africa and uh, he was also head of sales at that point um, at that time we were um, we were fico partners um, pick solutions of principa and so he was uh, he was far down the road with this particular lender in terms of selling them um, Triad plus the, the supporting services, right? And Triad, uh, in those times, probably the world's le leading account management or credit decisioning platform would really take them into the next era in terms of the, the accuracy of decisions and, uh, you know, the sophistication of uh, credit strategies they, they could deploy at scale. And so he was pretty confident that this client um, has... Uh, has bought into the journey he's taken them on and he flew uh, in country i think this was in kenya um, he flew in country to go and uh, to meet uh, the execs and the board to get you know what he thought uh, final approval on on his proposal and the transaction and when he got there after great effort and cost they informed him that they have um, decided in the meeting they informed him that they have decided to rather invest in buying a power dialer right so uh, for outbound collections and Stephen, to his credit without batting an eye looked at them all and said that's just fantastic now you're going to phone the wrong people a thousand times faster right so the model of that story is that uh, before you uh, you start uh, investing in technology make sure that you are making the right decisions so on that point i want to share um, a 
couple of definitions really just before I uh, before I get to uh, the approach I want to share in terms of how do you get started on this journey. And so really, if we talk about data and technology in managing credit decisions, when we talk about data, I mean, data is all about making better decisions, right? Um, data in itself doesn't allow you to make faster decisions. Data will allow you to make better decisions. And so the more data you have, remember my story about a man and his coffee, the more data you have that's applicable to the decision that you want to make, the better decision you can make. And again, if you go into your in your own environments, think about your your um, your own business and the decisions that's being made on a daily basis by your uh, front front office personnel, your manual underwriters. What data do they use to make a decision? Now, some of these data elements uh, might be might be relational in, in, in a way, right? So again, a few years ago, I had the privilege to, to interview with some of the um, MFSA members uh, based here in Cape Town and uh, doing fantastic uh, service in the, in the communities uh, around Cape Town. But understanding that the, the, the decisions they made, how much of that was uh, relational decisions, right? Understanding that... Um, Benny in front of me is on the Patty's uh, third son. They live around the corner. She's been a client. He's been a client and they'll be good for it, right? So there's a lot of familial data there that's not digitized in any form, but that uh, that is being used in the decision. So long story short, data, uh, better quality data gives you access to better decisions. Then from a technology perspective and an automation perspective, um, the value that uh, the technology will bring is allows you to make faster and more consistent decisions, right? And what's interesting here, understanding the power of uh, uh, technology and automation from a decisioning perspective. So in other words, taking the human out of the loop and human bias for, for that perspective is... Um, is uh, one of the, the well-known analytical uh, fallacies called the Monte Carlo fallacy or the gambler's fallacy. And uh, in an environment where decisions are made manually, uh, typically if you have manual underwriters, um, it is important to take note of this. So even if you have uh, a fairly structured decisioning process with uh, with rules and matrices and policies that guide your underwriters. What's fascinating about the Monte Carlo fallacy, and it got that name because in 1913, in Monte Carlo, they were uh, at the casino at the roulette wheel. There was an instance where the ball fell on black 10 times in a row. Right Now, I don't know who of you uh, have ever stood next to a roulette table, right? And... I wish I can see by show of hands. If I had to tell you, if you're standing next to a roulette table and the wall, the ball fell on black 10 times in a row, how many of you would put money on red? Because everything in you tells you that red has to come up now, right? It doesn't matter how you analyze it cognitively. Emotionally, as a human being, you're looking at this and you think red has to come up now. The chances of red coming up is just increasing time after time well the 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 hard truth is is that the roulette wheel there has no memory right and so the odds of red coming up after 10 blacks is exactly the same as red coming up on the first spin but that is the gambler's fallacy and you might wonder well what does the story of gambling got to do with underwriting they they did a test in india with a group of manual underwriters and the underwriters fall for the same fallacy if they've approved 10 loans then they believe they need to decline the 11th one as an example and what is even more fascinating about this human bias is that even if they reward the underwriters handsomely for sticking to the rules they cannot help themselves from becoming biased over time if they've got a long run of good customers right now 
this is stuff you need to think about because <laughs> we think we are rational beings and we're not, right? And I'm not talking about obvious biases, right? And, uh, and again, I think MFSA members in particular has got a lot more street cred in this space, right? Because you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, operate on bias. You're operating in hostile territory. Little data, low margins, um, lower LSM customers, higher risk. You have to be on point for the decisions you make. And so it's important to understand that that abstraction, once you've um, decided what is the decision you want to make when you automate it, you will remove that bias out of the system. It's a great, uh, it's a great motivation for that. And so then really just data-driven decisioning, as I said, data-driven decisioning doesn't live in the domain of technology. All of you do data-driven decisions on a daily basis. And so, again, do not be intimidated by the, the, the terminology or, um, or the science or the process. All of you make data-driven decisions. Some of you use the wrong data elements to make the decision, right, or, or insufficient um, data. And, uh, and at that point, specifically, I think also talking to the MFSA members that are, are maybe not as far advanced on the journey of sophisticated and automated decisions, right? It was also fascinating to me when, uh, when I was engaging with some members, not all, that I think there's still a large body. And again, I understand the sensitivity, I understand the cost, I understand the need for compliance um, and governance. But there's still a large body of members that view the Bureau inquiry as a grudge purchase, right? And it is something that is done to tick a compliance box and then ignored mostly, despite the value that it can bring. And so again, you know, if we talk about um, data uh, and and more sophistication, then you need to start considering the, the things that you're already spending money on and what the value could be there. And then I think just the last uh, on the definition front, before I get to um, the meat of what I want to share with you, it's just decision technology in general, or in our world, business rules management systems, right? Um, I think what's interesting is happening and... Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure, you know, I look at some of the sponsors, Micromax, and I know the journey they're on from their tech platform and, uh, and, and even the, um, the presentation we had earlier. And even all of your loan management platforms or systems, all of these systems do have uh, certain decisioning capability. Question is how sophisticated it is. At some point, you know, when you, when you issue a loan, there's the ability to uh, assign a price to it. Is it a simple lookup? Is it rules driven? Um, can you actually uh, execute a fairly complex decision there to optimize uh, what you're doing there? So decision technology uh, or decisioning in technology, again, is not a new principle. Most loan management systems have limited or, or uh, has certain capabilities in that space. When I talk about business rules management systems, and we're specifically talking about data and technology in managing credit um, decisions and managing your credit portfolio, I want you to think in terms of, uh, even if you're not a technologist, right? We all understand there's a difference between a database and an application, right? Most of us know that, you know, Oracle is a database, SQL is a database management system. So the whole point of SQL is to manage data. Uh, and, and, and that whole system was created for the management of data. And therefore, just follow that same level of abstraction when you look at your, um, your application environment, your loan management platform, your originations platform, your collection system, if you do have a collection system, then in the same way that all of those applications abstract the the actual application from the underlying database you need to extract or uh, or um, separate your actual application your operational um, layer in your system from the business rules that uh, that is required in the system and that's the place of a business rules management system if you can put it if i can uh, explain it that but again i want to um, I'll, I'll put it in a bit more context later, but a simple example. I mean, all of you 
if you've got an automated uh, call to the bureau, um, and the purpose of that call is to to get basic uh, consumer um, behavioral data plus a bureau score, right? That call to the bureau is conceptually a call to a business rules um, system, right? Because the bureau has got a sophisticated engine in the back that actually calculates the bureau score so that you can consume that as an output. So again, when you think about how do I go on this journey of using data and technology to support my credit process, think of it in the same way as how you got on this journey to decide when to call the bureau, right? Because that call to the bureau is a decision. Um, and it looks like a very simple decision, but it's actually a very complex decision that sits in the background. So you call the bureau with a name and an ID number, the bureau returns to you a three digit number that represents customer risk in the external environment. That's a sophisticated decision. And that decision has been abstracted from your system purely because you're consuming it as a service. Um, and so again, identify the decision point, but I'm uh, running ahead with my, uh, of my story here. So, okay, so we understand the place of data. We understand the need for making the right decisions before you make fast decisions. Otherwise, you just create a mess, right? No one wants to create the wrong decision a thousand times faster. You'd rather do the right decision a little bit slower. So, we understand the, the place that technology um, plays in that. And so, then when you look at your, your landscape from when a client walks into um, into your shop or when they apply digitally, you've got a digital uh, channel to the point where you finally write off the loan if they don't pay or hopefully where you engage your debtors and they actually do pay. There's a whole uh, life cycle of engagements with a client and if you look at your business um, from that perspective. So the, I, like to, um, I like to simplify this complexity with something I call question theory. Right. So when I engage with uh, with people and we're trying to understand what value principle can bring to the world, I start with this. It's what is your question? Right. Not, you know, how fantastic is our technology, how clever is our analysts? I start with what is your question? What is the question that you want answered? And we can answer it with uh, with analytics and technology. Sticking to the, the core principle. And so. If, as an example, what is your question? Well, when you originate credit, the big question up front usually is, what is the um, probability of default? In other words, what are the odds that this um, customer standing in front of me, what are the odds that he won't pay me? So that's a question, right? Then there may be other questions, depending again where you are on this journey. You may have questions regarding attrition, right? The customer phones you to do a balance inquiry, and you want to know when when you're talking to your existing customers, you want to know what are the odds that he's going to buy off this loan and go to someone else. That's a different question. Or when a customer stops uh, meeting his uh, contractual obligations, and now he's uh, two cycles in default, you want to know what are the odds that he's ever going to pay you back, or you want to know how much will he pay you back so that you can make a call whether it's worth pursuing him or just, you know, write him off and hand, handing him over for, uh, for external collections. Whatever your question is, the next, um, the next thing I would say is that you have to say, well, what data do I typically use to answer this question what do i have available at the moment to answer this question so uh, and that by answering that you identify your existing data universe right so it's a simple question if let's go into the collection space you want to know um, what is the propensity of payment right how likely is this client to pay you back what he now uh, what he, the amount that is now in default and so well, the question is, what data do you have available to inform that decision? That defines your, your, um, your data universe. Um, and then the other question is, what other data sources are available? And then I'm back on my, uh, my, my point on the Bureau. I think the, the bureaus, and specifically South African bureaus, with the sophistication of data, now and again, I understand in the MFSA, 
member base, you know, credit unaware and thin file is a real challenge um, as we're trying to drive financial inclusion and so forth. But the fact of the matter is for many of your clients, there is a wealth of bureau data available. Uh, you know, we're talking thousands of data points per consumer and that you may not have uh, considered as valuable or predictive yet, whereas they are highly predictable. Right? The, the wealth of bureau data goes so far beyond just the bureau score. I can, um, you know, I can spend an hour just talking about that. But back to my question theory, what other legal data sources may be available? And I've, I've put legal in brackets here because we, I mean, we've, we've mentioned um, Papia a bit earlier, but it is a real thing. All right, so what other legal and alternative data, alternative data sources have you got access to and is available in the market where the consumer has fully opted in and consented that this data may be used for this purpose? And even in that space, there's exciting things happening, right? Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the panel discussion a bit later. I think there's good discussions going to come out of that. But uh, there's a lot of pressure on... on uh, Driving financial inclusion on that quick uh, slide there on the SOBS uh, program of work, if you can put it that way, for 2022. Inclusion and uh, alternate data sources is even featuring on there, right? And we, we know from a SACRA perspective and an MFA, MFSA perspective has been topical. I mean, I've presented to this, uh, this forum before an alternate uh, scoring, alternate ways to look at uh, um, while generating data in order to inform the sins. So once you know what your question is and you understand what your available data universe is, right? Then we can start looking at the complexity of the question. And only then can we say, well, what, what is the right, uh, what is the weapon of choice here, if I can put it that way? And again, this is where you need to cut through the hype, right? Machine learning is not the, the answer for everything. Um, you know, um, scoring is not the answer for everything. Everything has a purpose and an application. And so if I say, once I know what my question is, and once I know what the data is, I have to answer the question, then I can say, well, what's the right mechanism to answer it? And sometimes the, the right tool might be a simple matrix, right? So the tool, the, the decision can be as simple as, well, if this is the condition, then that is the price I want to assign. It's a simple lookup table. Now, a lookup table is also what we in our world refers to as a decision metaphor. Um, an additive scorecard is also just a type of decision metaphor. The segmentation tree, you know, if you want to say, well, the question I want to answer is based on multiple dimensions. You know, it might be income, risk, affordability, product type, I don't know, a whole host of those. And only when I have all of those in a certain combination, when I say, this is what I want to do, this is the answer I want to pursue. And so, and then in some cases, you know, a sophisticated machine learning model might be the right approach. Again, depending on what it is that you, that you, where your question resides and what the appropriate tool is to answer the question with. And only at that point can you actually make a call as to whether you've got the appropriate technology to answer this question. So if we can recap, what is your question? What is the data that you have available? What is the right algorithm or tool to answer this question with? That will tell you whether you have the skill or the, the you know, the, the the mechanism with which to answer the question and you understand the sophistication of the questions that you need answered, then you can evaluate your, your, your current tech stack, right? And say, well, can I answer questions of this nature in my current platform? And so if, for an example, after the initial question, your conclusion is that I need to execute a complex machine learning model to answer this question. If your current loan management system and the other technologies that you have access to can't execute the machine learning model, then you know what to do, right? Then, then you only then do you start looking at technology, um, and not the other way around, right? Where vendors come past and they sell you um, 
technology solutions that can put a man on the moon, but you actually just want to go around the corner. So, um, yeah, I hope that uh, that gives some direction to that. But anyway, so at the end of the day, the, the ultimate goal is to operationalize this question and the answering. Right? So, again, the sophistication required to model the answer to the question. This is model development and analytics. The tools required to operationalize this, uh, the, the answering of this question, this is decision technology. And so understanding from the beginning, what is the available data? What is the question? And then ultimately, okay, how, how do I deploy this now in an environment where we, we're really looking at automated decisioning? So I hope that's uh, that's been useful. I think probably over time, the last thing I just want to stop with is that firstly, you don't have to do it all yourself, right? I'm just looking at the sponsor page at the beginning of the session, and I see many competitors there, but we're all on this journey together, right? And I know many of those competitors, you know, whether it's the bureaus, uh, Micromax, there's some other um, platform providers I've seen on that sponsor i know they're all on this journey we live in this era where it's all about consumption-based um, services call it in our world decisioning as a service right we all understand how to engage with netflix movies as a service you're not buying a technology platform you're renting access to movies right when you when you um Again, if you abstract your current relationship with your bureau of choice, whether it's Experian, Vericred, XDS, doesn't matter, right? That in its purest form is decisioning as a service. You haven't built the infrastructure to house all the data on your own customers from a payment profile perspective. You've not built the technology to actually calculate the bureau score. You simply call the bureau's API and they return a decision to you, which is the bureau score and some supplementing data and now that that same capabilities are available uh, for broader decisioning and if you look at your um, your loan management platform providers whoever um, you are dealing with some of them obviously more advanced and sophisticated on this journey than others but most of them have adopted this process of this we're living in a service-based um, era where you consume the service is as part of the, the total offering. You don't have to build it yourself. You don't have to become a, a data scientist or decision tech experts. As people running your individual businesses in this fairly challenging environment, you only need to understand the value that it can bring and where you want to start from a decisioning perspective. So identify your key decision points. I love the, the intro in terms of... Uh, um, taking action, starting small and dreaming big. All right? the, the principles stay the same. doesn't matter how big or complex the decision becomes. It always starts with what is my question? What is my priority? Where do I want to answer it? And how do I um, put it into my environment? That's my wow. story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yaku. I see while you were talking, the, the attendance actually increased. So. <laughs> Um, it, it is a good thing. Um, Daryl always says that um, data is like it's water and, and you can't live without water. And, and I totally agree with that. And the other thing that I agree with is um, you don't have to become an expert. There's a lot of experts out there already. So make use of those experts. Um, I don't think people always realize the importance of data and technology and how to use it, but I think you gave us a, a pretty good idea of, of what, you know, how important it really is. Um, is there any questions from, from our delegates that you would want to ask, Jakub? I don't see anything in, in the chat box. I see that Kurnai says he agrees with you. Prevention is better than cure, so cost to collect is always higher than acquisitions. Um, yeah, but if there is anything from our members, you can always put it in the chat box or you can email it to us and we can maybe have another follow-up discussion with, with Yaku. Yaku, thank you so much for this informative and inspirational and visionary talk. Um, we really do appreciate it and it was really informative for me as well. Right. Thanks, Renee. Uh, okay. Sorry, have a good day. I'm on Sunday. Yes, you too. Not bye a bye. problem. Hey, up next, we are going to have our fun element. So let's let's see what we are doing. So how it will work 
is guess the movie title from the sound clip provided. It's five movies, five winners, and each winner will receive a 250 Rand Take a Lot voucher. The first person to answer correctly in the chat box will be the winner, and the winner must please email admin at mfsa.net. So make sure your microphones are on, make sure your fingers are warm so you can type. So let's go. Okay, it's scary. Congratulations. I saw like you just heard it and you got it. So <laughs> congratulations, Harry. Um, and the answer is Rocky. Good. Frank Henderson with Top Gun. Yeah, congratulations, Frank. It is Top Gun. Um, luckily, this doesn't, well, maybe it does give our ages away, but yes, well done. Top Gun. Good. Whoa. <laughs> People were fought. Um, Let me just, uh, so the first person was Sunel. So now, congratulations. Um, yes, the answer is definitely Lion King. Next one. <laughs> Tulani Zwani. <laughs> Congratulations, Transformers. Then we're going into our last one. <laughs> Madagascar. Um, congratulations, everyone. Please remember to send your names and details and everything to admin at MFSA so you can get your prizes. And I'm so sorry, I see a number of times Beauty and the Beast was up there, so we didn't use them, but next time we will definitely maybe make, make use of Beauty and the Beast theme song. Well done, everyone. Um, that was actually quite nice. I didn't know half of the, of the answers, so it's good that you educated me a bit. Okay, so next we are going into our panel discussion, facilitated by Daryl, and Daryl is from SACRA. I'm going to do an introduction of our panelists and also of our facilitator. Daryl has been part of SACRA since 2012. She's a former NCR Bureau Compliance and Research Manager, and Daryl has a lot of insights into the industry and specifically into data, and we can actually learn quite a lot from her. Also on the panel, our panelists, or um, Marina Short, but she um, she uh, she issued her apology. Can unfortunately not attend. Kurnai Furi, Hans Zacher, Dirk Barnors, and Alex Moir. Um, so Kurnai is head of SMME at Experian, and he joined CopyScan Experian in 2002. I think Kurnai is really a familiar, um, you know, face for the industry. So welcome, Kurnai. Hans is also the Vice President um, of Solutions at TransUnion Africa. He joined TransUnion in 2019, but he has a lot of IT, entrepreneurship, and business analysis skills. 
Then we have Dirk Bardnors. He is a CEO at Very Credit. He joined Very Credit in 2018. He's got an LLB and a BCom in Business Management and Law. He's an admitted attorney, a compliance manager, focuses on leadership, risk management, and legal advice. So then we have Alex Moore. He's the commercial executive at Expert Decision Systems. He joined XDS in 2012. He's got a diploma in cost and management accounting. He was very good in business analysis, business process improvement, and business intelligence. So I think all of these panelists know and see the importance of data. So Daryl, it's over to you. Thank you, Leonie. Good morning to everybody. Morning, our panelists. I hope we're set to have a little bit of fun. I must say, Yako, you evoked quite a lot thought process in my head with your presentation. And it actually brought me to consider innovation and technology and data and decide that actually data is not limited by technology and it's not dominated by technology. And I base that on this little fact. Do we know or did we know that the oldest credit bureau in South Africa was once owned by a pay TV station called Mnet? And the philosophy in Mnet acquiring the pay TV, uh, the, the uh, credit bureau was to use the technology that the transmission of television programs happened with was to be used for the transmission of data to point of sale. That plan went awry though. And I was actually working for the pay TV station at the time. And the marketing director asked me to go and assist the credit bureau that had been acquired. And I was really, really reluctant going, no, 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 no. That's so boring after this pay TV station environment. I can't possibly go work. Credit data, boring. Well, I have to tell you that was 30 years ago and I've spent the last 30 years basically around the world of data, mostly in the credit uh, reporting space, either with the regulator as mentioned by Leone. And the truth is in 30 years, I haven't stopped learning. And even today I was learning. And I hope that with the panel today, we're going to impart some knowledge that our listeners and participants today will find useful. So we've heard who's on the panel. I've tried to just, uh, sort of shape the conversation we're going to have around the topic of innovation, but allowing each panelist to use their area of expertise. And I'm going to start with Hans. Hans, we've heard lots today about data, decision tools, you know, apps, et cetera. What do you think the world of the credit bureau is going to look like in the medium to short um, future? Because right now in my head and in the heads of many people I spoke to, a bureau really is a library of information and that information is turned into some form of decision assistance, either in a score or some other model that predicts some sort of behavior. How do you think technology is going to impact the bureau and what's going to happen in the bureau space, given all the data that's available currently in the universe. No, th thanks, Daryl, and, and morning to, to everyone. Um, um, and th thanks for the question. I, I think, you know, based on the what's been said in the webinar today, I mean, we, we certainly at a uh, we're in an interesting time, right? And and I think um, if you look at the the state of the world today, um, the economies of the world are in, in a bit of trouble. Uh, consumers are facing a lot of hardship, et cetera. Um, and, and when you when you start thinking about the, the role of the Bureau, um, what, what we talk about a lot is how do we make trust possible, right? Um, and I think Yaku kind of referred to that, that there's, there's sort of some complex decision-making sitting in the background uh, made on a lot of different data sets, which essentially is used to make the credit lending decisions within the market. And, and when you think about trust and how we make that possible, um, there, there's a lot to that, right? So how does the lender trust that the, uh, the person taking the loan or uh, the customer is going to pay it back? And um, how do we make sure that there's not reckless lending practices in the market so that uh, essentially the financial stability of the, of the market is maintained? But, but I think beyond the, the basics, and when you talk about data and innovation and, and technology, um, you know, it was also referred to around the, the role that we all need to play in financial inclusion. And if you think about the, the tough times we're going through, I think uh, from a bureau perspective, and I think it's, it's true of everyone on this call, is 
how do we contribute to economic growth and lifting uh, the country and the continents uh, and uplifting uh, you know, the, the people's lives that, uh, where we operate, right? And, and I think when we start thinking about how we use um, these technologies and data in that financial inclusion world, it, it does ask us to be a lot more innovative in terms of how we make trust possible in that sort of underserved or unserved um, communities. Now, now we, we know that there, there's probably two segments that are gonna drive economic growth for us. Um, the first is the uh, underserved, unserved, um, credit invisible consumer. Um, and the second is our SME community. They are our best hope of economic growth. And both of those communities in the world today um, can't get access to credit. So, so I think we need to kind of think about how we are going to use that technology. And, and let me be clear, all the technology we need, we have. Uh, but now it's how we take that technology and apply the right use cases to, to really kind of drive that, that greater good and economic growth. Thanks for that, Hans. Alex, can you tell me, is your view similar to Hans's when you consider the commercial um, credits and risk space? Part of it is. Um, I do think that starting where Hans finished off, we have the technology. I think uh, do we necessarily have the same appetite in terms of the providers supplying that data, especially if you look at it from an SME perspective? Um, or the un, un, unserved market, maybe that's the bit that needs to change. So if, if you take a look, you know, um, in the commercial space, I keep telling everybody, we're probably about 10 to 15 years behind, just in terms of the quality and volume, frequency of data that's available for SME, uh, for credit providers to make a decision on SMEs. So I think there's a massive opportunity and it, it takes back to how you started the question with Hans. Bureaus have always typically been aggregators. So, you know, it's not just about taking the data, it's about the intelligence we add to it. But that's with what we have. There's so much more out there that would then make a more complete profile on the consumer and on the commercial side. So I, I still think that there's a, uh, an interesting future ahead of us. Let's see. So would you say, and this is to the panel, would you say that somebody needs to take the lead in this commercial data acquisition? Should we wait for legislation to force it? You know, what, what's going to galvanize it? If you look at the consumer space, I mean, the oldest consumer bureau started, I think, in 1890. In, I think it was Europe or the UK. So, you know, there was a a huge impetus behind consumer information and sharing of that and reporting of that way before legislation came about. Do you think the same sort of journey should be taken with the commercial data? How are we, how are we going to galvanize it? Because Hans pointed out, Alex also, and I think every other person in this meeting understands the importance of SMMEs in our economy and in driving employment, et cetera. What's going to make it happen? Who's going to make it happen? If we're waiting for legislation, I think we're asking for trouble. Um, I think, you know, we, we've already had a footprint, and, and now I'll do a bit of a sacra punt for you. That <laughs> we, we've already had a footprint that, that's lasted over 20 odd years in terms of there has to be a central focus point that, that drives things like format and rules and, and client engagement and onboarding. And if we get that, then I think it makes it a lot easier. Legislation has a role to play in terms of making everybody supply it. So NCR, all credit providers need to submit their data to the bureaus. Uh, nice that legislation dictates that in the consumer space. That's not there in the commercial. What I do sometimes think that we need to keep in mind is it was a journey. The, the format that's currently there now wasn't what everybody started off with. And, and sometimes we get caught up in what is the final goal and we try and get it as big as possible and we don't show the value it's going to be adding to anybody's space so nobody buys in. Nobody wants to be first. Mm. So what I'm hearing is it's all about the data. 
So the question, Dirk, for you is, how is this going to happen if the Protection of Personal Information Act, as an example, is a little restrictive about what can happen with data and who can use it and for what purpose? So you have, on one hand, an explosion of data through various technologies, and then on the other hand, you have this legislative environment, which is mm, kind of put in a little bit of a damper on the use of the data. What's your view in terms of how these interests are going to be balanced between the protection of the person who, who is the data subject or the entity that is the data subject and the interests of business in using that information? Thanks, Daryl. So I think that's an important point. Um, firstly, uh, as you started off mentioning that, you know, it is highly, highly regulated. Um, the data that the bureaus hold, um, it is mandated by all of the data contributors to send that to the bureaus for decisioning purposes. But I think a big change um, that has come through in recent times um, and that is very prevalent is obviously consumers are more aware of their rights um, and with the with the enforcement of the poppy act um, uh, consumers are actually allowed to you know uh, get access to their data um, and but it's a balancing act in terms of you know we, we as bureaus need to hold data on the bureau um, for decisioning purposes, but on the on the other side of the coin is that that data needs to be protected. Um, so going forward, I think for each business, not not only bureaus but also the members on the call, um, it is critical to make sure that the privacy is taken care of um, and that it that is a focus area of the business but also the poppy act in the preamble states that you know access to information is also one of the driving factors um, and one of the uh, focus areas of the regulator itself so um, just to keep in mind that it is it is a it is a balancing act and it's it's two sides of the same coin you can't have one without the other you can't have privacy without having also access to uh information for the right and legitimate purposes i think that was very well summed up do we agree panel yes. yeah I, I think i think we do um what i would also say is um, consumers or businesses are also becoming, while they, while they understand their rights, um, they also understand that providing access to their data ultimately does help them uh, get access to the financial services that they're looking for as well. So if you look at the trends that are happening um, in Europe and more developed economies around consumer consent of data, you're actually starting to see a, a pretty good uptake where people are saying, well, if, if you know, I will give consent to my bank account to this thing to that thing, if I can get this product. So I think, you know, it's, it's kind of this balance between uh, protecting information. And I think as the holders of the information, you know, we have an obligation there, uh, but also I think consumers over time and through education will also recognize that, you know, providing consent to that, 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 that data gets them there where they want to be. So whether you're a consumer trying to buy a car or a house to get a loan or a first clothing account, or whether you're a business trying to invest in you know, equipment or the rest of it, I think there's a clear link uh, between consumers owning their credit, owning their score, owning their data, uh, but also um, using that data for the purposes of, of uplifting their own personal situations. So I think it's going to be an interesting walk to, to to do, um, I think obviously the focus of the regulation coming in very recently is the, you know, the fear is there, right? Um, but I think it will pivot perhaps to a more balanced view as, as we go forward. Thanks for that, Hans. Well, now I've got a mean one for you, but it's one of great interest to the people that I did a little bit of research with in preparation for today, which is that there's a wealth of information available from the bureaus. But typically, an MFSA member has a limited budget in terms of data acquisition versus, for example, a bank who can buy an infinitely more, infinitely more data uh, to inform their decision in. How best can an MFSA member optimize the use of the data? Because obviously, the you know, economies of scale is a reality. But what, what can an MFSA member do to optimize their utilization of bureau information? Thanks, Daryl. Um, yeah, quite a broad spectrum you're, you're touching base on. 
because if you think about it, your credit providers and MFSA members are not just your um, small leaners, they're big leaners as well. And it has to do with budget and the reason why I made the previous comment when Yaku was speaking, because acquisition these days on um, uh, is, uh, is, is hard if it comes to the point that you need to do when you do an inquiry. So, um, and also the point that um, people need to budget in the times where we are, you need to look at your collection cost, your maintaining cost of um, your clients, and then end of the day when you make a decision on it. So to do your point specifically, yeah, it depends on clients and, and Michael and specifically. So if I want to go that route specifically, I would say it is to do with your decision matrices that you use within your business, your credit policies, and everything that you can link. Um, clients uh, these, da these days are very smart. It's not a case of just pulling an inquiry in the end of the day and just look at the data and they do and make a decision. They do much more prep on it, their, um, their acquisition on specifically uh, on, on new clients and existing clients has changed. Their way of their pre presenting their products towards clients have changed immense. And they're not just that the technology from a FinTech point of view has changed as well with APIs, integrations, and they're using those um, decision matrices that they're using and they're popping it into those FinTech environment on APIs. So to make it better before they even start doing inquiries. So what we see most of uh, your biggest players of in a in micro lending market is the cut of rules that they're using or decisions they're making before even popping a, a beer inquiry, that knock of rules that they are implementing, but also that building into their decision matrices and as well as their um, uh, acquisition when, when a client is standing there. But also being smart in a sense as well, when what were they doing to offer the, the products they currently have to the existing market by enticing these clients by using the data. So broad spectrum, if you speak about cost, cost is cost, and uh, competitiveness within a cost environment is huge. So we all know that. But the clients are being, uh, especially how we see it, is being very reluctant if it comes to when they approach us, but also they've been smart because they look at it and they will say, tell us, listen, but if I look at an inquiry and what do I see from inquiry, what can I do with the data that's currently available for me? In an IR environment that we speak about, we speak about big data and not just bureau data, because you're, I'm touching a little bit on your other questions you probably want to ask, is uh, your data is not linked towards just the bureau of financial data that you guys are seeing, but also the uniqueness of other data that people are popping in. So it also to do with the, the, the point of appetite. Uh, one Michael Lennon will look at it and say, listen, I need it for compliance and decision matrix is an end of the day to make sure that by the time the client leaves my, my, my shop, uh, I make sure that he is going to pay me back. While others will use it to say, listen, what else can I pro probably offer this specific client than the standard, if I may, one month loan that they're currently getting? And then there's others that will say, listen, what can I give the client to enrich my world but as, as well his world so you can have a sustainable business or a sustainable person as a consumer out there as well. And then there's the last side regarding the collection as well. So I think that's to do mostly to do with appetite and it's linked towards your career providers that has got a career policy that's linked towards his uh, um, way of how he runs his business. Right. And certainly I've taken from that also a point that Jaco made, which was it depends on which question you're trying to answer in terms of the data you acquire and at which point you acquire it. Correct, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's how we see it. You know, a, a collection company has got a different appetite compared to a Michaelina. A bank has got a total different appetite compared to a Michaelina. And it's, it's two different market segments, although both of them is to do with a consumer and is to do with, with, with money in the end of the day that needs to be collected or been lent out. But mm -hmm. uh, the, the point of it is, is appetite. So when you look at a client and when we look at clients, we look at what they want within <laughs> to, to what say, the law that the compliance side can give us to them. But um, um, clients, are, clients becoming more sophisticated, becoming more diversified in how they do things. You, you see the normal Michael Lena that will come to you and say, listen, um, I've been using your credit check for, for numerous years and I want to diversify my business in such a way that I can mine my existing base. So all has to do with, with appetite. Hmm. Thank you for that, Corne. Here's a thought. 
I looked at the National Credit Regulators website and looked at how many consumers had accessed their credit profiles and how many disputes were logged and how many were resolved in favor of consumers. And I found only 42,250 disputes were, were resolved in favor of consumers. So is that an indication of positive performance by data contributors and bureaus, or is that an, an indication possibly of under reading that consumers aren't inquiring enough about what's in their profile? What's the panel's view? Carol, um, I think it's a data quality issue. Um, so the, um, the members or the data contributors have a responsibility to submit quality data to the bureaus. Um, and that's where it starts. Um, if the data is fails validation, that ends up as disputes. Um, so I think the, the disputes process is a net to catch whatever is not submitted correctly. Um, but the responsibility starts with the consumer um, submitting correct data to the to the lender or to the data contributor, and then the data contributor sending that data in uh, the the best possible um, uh, for form and in terms of a high quality to the bureau, and that would result in uh, a, a minimization of the space at the bureau. Yeah, yeah. I think the process we described is one hundred percent right. I was quite impressed though. I thought 42,000 disputes out of 55 million records is a pretty good record. What's the Bureau's view on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question, Daryl. Um, you know, because I, I think to the point that Dirk is making is for every 42,000, you know, how many are not being disputed with their data mm -hmm. policy to their source? Um, I think, you know, when, when you look at sort of whole scale uh, data issues within a particular file, that, that's pretty easy to pick up and, you know, probably is rectified quite quickly. Uh, but I think it's in that granular level, level of detail that, that you're probably going to miss those things. So I think, I think it's, a, it's an interesting question um, and probably also talks to well, how these consumers actually find things that the information is incorrect, is it that they have been denied for a loan or whatever the case may be is, um, and how many actually just, just walk away. So, I mean, we know from research that one of the biggest fears of any consumer in the application process is being rejected. Right? It's a psychological thing. And, you know, after, after being rejected, um, does the average consumer actually engage um, with, the, with that dispute process? So I don't have the answers for you, but I think there's a, a lot in there. Um, I think what we do have a responsibility to do is to make that dispute process as easy as possible, right? And, you know, when we talk about technology and using digital and automation is how do we create the right sort of platforms um, and the right education to, to make consumers comfortable to, to lodge those disputes in the first place and then get better and better at uh, processing them. And I think uh, that we've got obligations at a, at a wholesale data quality level uh, as an industry uh, but also to um, help consumers um, kind of clean up their profiles where, where perhaps they're incorrect to capture. Yeah, indeed. So it Darryl, is everybody's I, job. Cornet. Uh, Daryl, if I may. So there is, a, there is a point of responsibility towards the consumer as well. And I think the awareness from bureaus need to, and I'm sorry, stepping over the line a bit, but the awareness needs to be a little bit more, or be, be more made aware because they, you can still come across the consumer that I, I do it when I'm standing around a, a, a fire and having a bribe with my mates and ask them, listen, do you know what's happening with your, your credit score or your data? They don't know what I'm speaking about. No. And then sometimes you will, if when people ask me for oh, who are you working for? And I will say experience. They will tell me, so what do you do? And I will explain and they still look a question mark towards them. And some of them are educated people and you will you would think listen they would know how it would work so i think there's still a line of of education that still needs to happen for the the, the consumer out there that still needs to come and say listen let me register on the bureau's um, um sites where i can actually go and see my free credit report and have a look um do it monthly do it yearly because we that's one of our our, our, our Oh, ways we can safeguard our future if it comes to data as well. Yeah. Hello. Thanks for that. Alex. I don't think 42,000 is that bad a number if you think it's 55 million over six bureaus. 
Um, the other side of it is out of the 42,000, how many would have been removed because of no feedback from a credit provider? Because it would still have been resolved in the consumer's favor, but not necessarily because the data was wrong. Mm. It might just be that a credit provider hasn't taken part in the process as well. So I do agree with what Hans was saying that we try and make it as easy as possible. But if you take a look at the numbers, it's not bad. And, and then it ties in with what Dirk and has been saying that in terms of having that central point and running a process, where what's the average rejection? It's supposed to be under 2% when you're running yep. across millions of records. Uh, and, and look at the data quality projects that have been involved uh, from a credit provider, from a bureau perspective over the years. I think is why we're in a, a relatively comfortable spot. Mm. Absolutely. So I wanted to give you each an opportunity to impart one pearl of wisdom because I think we're running out of time. We're starting to get to the end of our time. So can I start with you, Cornet? What would your pearl of wisdom be for our audience today in terms of bureaus, data, technology? Yeah, quite a big one. You didn't even give me a chance to quickly think about it, but let me start to see if I can wing it. So uh, yeah, and, and at the end of the day, I think most uh, credit providers that's on a call um, you, you look at to safeguard your future. You want to make sure that at the end of the day, you've got a sustainable business going forward. And people think that it, it is your building, it's your computers, it's your money that you're leaning out, it's actually your asset, but it's not. It's the data within your, your software solutions, your LMS, your data systems that you're using. We've seen it before where people lose that specific data and that data is, is the core of function of their, of their business. Now, if you think about that, you need to think also what comes along with it. And then, then your clients come, your, your stock comes, and then your money that you need to lean out. But uh, we always say it, and it's an old saying that I've been taught back in the day, that you want to make sure that you're a profitable business. So you want to make sure whatever solutions you are using, and especially from a bureau perspective, you're doing everything in your power to make sure you've got the right information for the right source, the right decision, so by the time the client walks out of your door, you actually know you've helped the client from a consumer base, he's happy, but you're also safeguarding your future going forward as a business. And that's where the Bureau plugs in very nicely. Thanks for that, Corne. Alex, you want to give it a go? There's more to the commercial, uh, there's more to the credit universe than just the consumer. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> so, true. So the pearl of wisdom we would like to impart is that there are obviously a couple of initiatives on the go. Um, I think what, what every business wants to make uh, certain of is by the time they're making a decision, it's because all the information is available. It's not because it's disparate or they're making a, 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 a call, despite, irrespective of which question they're trying to answer. They're not making a decision based on incomplete or inaccurate kinds of data. So obviously I'm looking at this from a commercial perspective and I'm going, look, there's a massive opportunity here. It would be interesting to see, you know, how far down we take an SME in individual verse is he a sole prop and, and, and what the rules are around that. But the more people that, or the more companies we get to share that information, I think it opens up a, an ideal space to be in the next coming, coming years. So your flag is share, share and share. Share, share, and share in a, in a structured format, please. <laughs> please. Otherwise, it'll be six formats. For Thanks, Alex. Dirk. Thanks, Daryl. Um, so just to keep with the theme of the day um, around financial inclusion, um, I would just like to uh, remind the attendees that, um, you know, new technologies are really transforming customer expectations um, and you know, these technologies are especially widely and easily adopted by the current tech savvy younger generation. Um, and if you think about it, these individuals might currently be un un unbanked um, and they might at this stage still be in school or university. But in a few years, this generation will actually be the major re revenue contributors of, of the lenders um, and the members of MFSA. Um, and you know, I think it would therefore be advisable for the lenders to actually keep an open mind about new technologies and new data sets um, that will influence credit decisioning in the future. Um, and yeah, you know, I think 
uh, bureaus are, are drivers of innovation um, within, within our space. Um, there's, there's obviously a lot of cool things um, that, that's coming out uh, of the industry. Um, a, lot, uh, a lot of fintechs are busy with quite a, quite a lot of things. Um, but, but at the end of the day, um, you know, the bureaus um, do offer a lot of services and I think are well positioned to also, you know, play our part in this. Um, and for example, Vericred has uh, developed uh, and we are currently testing an alternative risk score um, in the South African and Sub-Sahara sub market. Um, and, you know, I think this will go a long way to actually drive financial inclusion for the unbanked. Um, and um, I, I invite members to, to reach out to us if they have any questions or are just curious about this. Um, and you know how this how can th this can can drive financial inclusion for for consumers in South Africa. Thanks, Dirk. Hans, yes, I, I thought Dirk was going to steal my pearl, but luckily <laughs> on the table. Um, but you know, kind of a, a related view, and, and to agree with what Alex said, you know, whether you talk about the two and a half million informal businesses um, or you know the. 63% of Sub-Saharan Africans who have no bank account. Um, there's a huge opportunity here. And you know, to the membership base, you, you can sit there and think, well, you know, all these new technologies and all these old data scores, that's for the big banks, that's for the big lenders, that's not for me. And I think the one thing that, that uh, we were learning quite quickly is it's the smaller, perhaps the more agile individuals who can adopt these technologies uh, quite a lot quicker than the big tankers of the big lenders out there. And, and I think if you, you know, if, one, if anything around the old data analysis has told us is that it is hugely predictive and there absolutely is lift and you can get visibility. But I think the, the thing to play off against is the ease of adoption, right? And I think. I would argue that uh, perhaps the, the smaller guys are going to adopt those things a lot quicker than the bigger guys with all their legacy structures and all those good things. So um, I think there's huge opportunity. Um, absolutely, you need a sustainable business. Uh, but I, what I also say is um, I think there, there's something around adopting those technologies to, to drive your business forward. Thank you, Hans. So size does matter after all. Yeah, smaller is better sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. So I would venture this in closing, that regardless of the technology or which aspect of data, what nature of data, as long as there is current data available about how much I can pay and whether I will pay, a risk and credit decision can be made. So I wish you all the very best in your businesses, MFSA members, and you have a really good set of bureaus available to your services in South Africa. Panelists, thank you very much. Leonie, thank you. Back to you. Thank you Thanks, so sir. much, Daryl. This was very informative. Thank you to all of the panelists. I think, you know, we received some, some great information. Yes, I think if you ever need any assistance with regards to data and getting information, there is definitely wonderful service providers out there that are more than willing to assist you. Thank you once again for the discussion. And um, we really do appreciate the support of our service providers and also educating our members. We are going now to send you a short link. Please fill in the survey and that will determine, you know, our road ahead and what we are planning. And then uh, Kirsten has posted it now in the chat box. And we really want to um, thank our members for, for their attendance. It's really crucial for us that you attend these sessions, you stay educated, you stay up to date. It's also very important for our service providers to also join in in the meetings. So once again, thank you, everyone. Remember to take our quick survey. We look forward to see you at our debit check session and also at our AGM and conference. You must have a lovely day and a lovely afternoon. And we do thank our sponsors also for their participation in the sessions. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day.